guys. We'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and jump in here. Okay. And I'm we're we're quite flexible on on the format this time around as well uh, because this is the first time we've done for what it's worth. <laughs> Our yeah. you guys are launching the Ocean Book Club, which is fantastic. So you know, normally in the research series, we kind of reserve anywhere between twenty, you know, sometimes up to thirty minutes for kind of initial discussion and presentation. So don't feel free to to take as long as you'd like. You don't have to take that long to kind of tee this up. Um, and then we'll okay. just dive right into just kind of reflections and questions from there. Okay, and um, so Scott, you'll manage the the queue, uh, the chat, and the queue. Okay, that, that that's you. right. Thank you very that's exactly much. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, no problem at all. No problem at all. Okay, well, excellent. Well, without further ado, then we'll go ahead and get started. So, um, good afternoon, good morning, <laughs> good evening, potentially. Um, thank you all so much for joining us in the in the Ostrom uh, Workshops Research Series today. We're thrilled to uh, to have you and to launch um, a new mini series within this series, and that is the uh, the Ostrom Book Club. And this is a fantastic book to begin with today, um, featuring dispute system design, preventing, managing, and resolving conflict. And we're lucky to have all three um, authors on the uh, on the line today. So Lisa Amsler, of course, from um, used to be SPIA, now we're calling it the O'Neill School, <laughs> as of not too long ago. Um, and Lisa, of course, has been a, a really a, a pathbreaker in this field for quite some time now um, and a long time uh, workshopper. So we're very lucky to have you join us, Lisa. Janet, um, if you tuned in a few minutes ago, we have a bit of a history of, as well, which is fantastic. Janet Martinez, professor at uh, Stanford Law School and similarly, a world renowned expert in, this con in the context of dispute resolution. And Stephanie Smith, who I must say, and I have to apologize, I'm not as familiar with, but I'm very thrilled <laughs> to have you join us as well, Stephanie. So we'll give you guys at least uh, the opportunity to um, uh, in introduce yourselves in any uh, additional ways that you would like to, um, as well as the project itself. And then from there, per usual, we will take the discussion. And if you'd like to, feel free to use the chat box at any point to kind of pose questions, that's fine. Uh, but remember, for, for live questions, just use the raise hand feature. And that's a great way for, to help me uh, keep track of the queue. Um, so without further ado then, um, let's turn it over to, uh, to you, Lisa and Janet and Stephanie for any uh, comments you'd like to make. And thanks so much again for this opportunity. We're excited. Well, we're, we're thrilled. And, uh, and Stephanie, her current affiliation is with the Flora Family Foundation, but she has also for many years taught uh, courses at Stanford Law School and team taught with Jan and taught the dispute system design course uh, before Jan was there. So we're, we're all thrilled to be here. Just quickly, and I'll, I'll, I had I thought we had 15 minutes each, Jan and I, but I'll try to make this fast. Oh, no, no, you do, you do. Don't, don't feel free to take that time, Lisa. That's completely okay. fine. Okay, great. Um, first of all, why the workshop? Why should the workshop care about this work? Uh, second, we'll just talk about where the literature has been, the, the normative aspects of the book, um, which include control over dispute system design and, and justice, and then, one piece of uh, the analytic framework that Jan will talk about, which is transparency, accountability, and evaluation. So that's what I'm going to try to whip through. Now, in terms of why should you care? You should care because Lynn cared. Drat, you know, here it is. It's in the principles of, of the IAD, conflict resolution mechanisms. They're in governing the commons. This definition of appropriators and their officials have rapid access to low cost um, local, local arenas to resolve conflicts among appropriators or between appropriators and officials. And the language changed a little bit in understanding institutional diversity to users instead of appropriators. Appropriators does sound like a sort of, anyway, I like users. So it's there, it's always there. Now, the workshop has been supporting this notion of applying um, the IAD to conflict management for years. Uh, Lynn was at a talk I presented at the workshop in 2008 on designing justice, which was about this. Um, there was the workshop part, book party, which was an amazing experience and just wonderful feedback that greatly improved the book. And thanks to Mike McGinnis and Bernie Fisher and Dan Cole and all the others who participated. And then the, uh, through the workshop, I was invited to write about 
in a special issue on Lynn's work on the evolution of social norms, I was invited to apply that to conflict resolution uh, at about the same time as the book party. So, so how are we using it? Well, we're, we're using IAD because when you start looking at dispute resolution and these processes and these programs and these cases, they're nested, right? I mean, an arbitration case is an action arena that may be nested in an arbitration program and clause that's nested in a personnel manual or policy in an, in a company or a, or an agency or a, a non, an NGO internationally, and so all of the analytic categories in the IAD are totally easy to apply to something like a mediation case or an arbitration case nested in one of these programs. Um, but we've got DSD literature out there that's independent, that's been there for 100 years, uh, but not necessarily called dispute system design or DSD until uh, the 1980s with the book uh, that was done by Yuri Brett and Goldberg resolving um, about resolving disputes. So we, we track it back to Mary Parker Follett, whose work on integrative negotiation, and she was both in management and public administration, never gets cited by getting to yes, even though it inspires getting to yes. Um, then we have dispute system design coined in 1988. Then we have related books that don't use quite the same language or articles, Mary Rowe at MIT as an ombuds, um, Douglas McCabe in the business arena, Christina Sickles Merchant, uh, and, and Kathy Costantino in the federal government, and they're using organizational development. And then we've got uh, a study of the Fortune 1000 and, and employment and arbitration use in those companies done at uh, the Cornell School of Industrial and Labor Relations. And then we've got a law school textbook done uh, by Nancy Rogers, Bob Fordone, Frank Sander, and Craig McEwen. But none of them talk about Ostrom or the IAD or make any connections. And these you'll see are they're in multiple different disciplines. So we start putting it all together in chapter one. And uh, what we focus on in particular, and there are lots of lawyers in the workshop, is this notion of the rules, rules on paper and rules in use and how rules are exogenous variables in the IAD because all of these different action arenas, mediation, arbitration, negotiation, they're all nested ultimately in a legal framework. And, and that raises the issue when I first started writing about this before I actually met Jan, was this question of control over dispute system design. Does a third party design the system, not one of the disputants? or do two parties or all the parties who are gonna use the system get a voice in designing it? Or is it one party? And this all came up because of the um, Supreme Court decision in Gilmer that authorized mandatory adhesive arbitration, which now covers 75% of private sector employees in the United States and, and is a serious problem. But in each of these cases, you've got something that is set up essentially in, in a statute. So third party, the Federal ADR Act of 1998 requires every federal court to create an ADR program. Uh, both parties, just one example, the National Labor Relations Act authorizes collective bargaining in the private sector. We have similar state statutes and public sector statutes. And then this weird new interpretation of the Federal Arbitration Act, which from 1925 was not interpreted this way until 1991 to authorize corporate America to basically preclude going to court for employment or consumer conflict. So when we think about um, justice, which is the other big normative thing, there is a literature on accountability in the public sector. And um, what we have found useful is the work done uh, by Mel Dubnik and his co-authors, George, the late George Fredrickson and um, Kai Feng Yang. And there are six promises. There are three that are instrumental and three that are in, intrinsic. So the instrumental promises have to do with the means or mechanisms in a system. And they never, by the way, Nobody in, in uh, public affairs applies this to accountability forums 
like administrative law judge cases, but we do. Um, so uh, control over inputs, ethical behavior and processes, performance man in management and measurement, both of those things. Then these intrinsic promises, ends or virtues, integrity of the system, legitimacy of the processes and justice never defined in this literature. So we, talk, we talked about how to define justice in the book party and also um, in that earlier talk that Lynn attended. And so there are many ways, I'm only gonna talk about a couple of examples. In chapter 12, we talk about distributive justice, particularly in arbitration and how it's possible to design these arbitration systems so that they are, they, uh, the results of the arbitration systems favor the repeat player, which is generally the company setting up the program, statistically significantly more often they win as compared to a one-shot player like a company that's only there once uh, and not hiring arbitrators repeatedly. And their question, unresolved question, and this work has been replicated uh, by multiple people in multiple contexts, particularly five different faculty at Cornell um, and cited by the, the uh, US Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals last year. Um, it could be bias. It might not be bias, we'll see. but in any event, the last um, example I want to give you before we go to Jan, that is a book chapter, is on the an employment mediation program at the Postal Service the Redress Program that uses the frame of procedural and organizational justice. And again, we're using justice to measure the success and effectiveness of the program. We're using justice as a dependent variable. So this is the normative frame of the book, the view that any dispute system design ought to deliver some measure of justice and people who use it ought to participate in designing it so that the measure of justice it affords is one that they agree with and buy into. Um, in this particular example that is a chapter, uh, the O'Neill School for 12 years was the national uh, location for the redress evaluation project. We ended up with seven uh, databases. One of them had 276,000 exit surveys using procedural justice kinds of questions. And everybody, employees and supervisors were equally satisfied, no statistically significant difference between them on the process and their information about it or their individual mediator. Um, there was a slight difference uh, with respect to outcome, but that correlated with expectancy theater, theory. They were still, the majority of both employees and supervisors were satisfied with the outcome and the program reduced formal complaints nationwide. There are other chapters on restorative justice and community mediation and collaborative governance and public engagement. And we're applying that locally in a current project on community voices for health in Monroe County that has been funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And I look forward to talking with folks at the workshop about that. And now over to Jan, and I'm stopping screen share. Your turn. Well done, Lisa. I think you had a minute to spare. <laughs> <laughs> I, can tell I grew up in New York on Long Island. I used to cut school and go see the ballet and Broadway. And I can talk really fast. Half of my family is from New York. I love it. Oh, I think Janet, you might still be on um, on mute. I'm so sorry. There okay. we go. Great. Here I am. Uh, good afternoon uh, to you in the Midwest, uh, and thanks to Lisa for arranging and connecting us, and Scott for welcoming us. And I want to shout out to my colleague Bill Blomquist who I believe is also there and has been a research partner for several years out, um, out in California. So I am going to uh, start. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for setting us up uh, and giving us a, a solid foundation out of Ostrom's work. And so let's see here. Yep, there we are, uh, to just define our terms. Uh, it's not complicated, it sounds fancy. One or more processes adopted to prevent, manage, 
or resolve a stream of disputes connected to a given organization or institution. So Elise has already highlighted a number of applications, but we have a, an array that of design contexts that you can imagine. So starting at the public community justice level, uh, certainly court is the one that uh, most of us, all the lawyers are familiar with and the use of not only court procedures, a bench trial, jury trial, but also ADR. So these are process options. Uh, claims facilities like 9-11 or Katrina or BP, uh, where you have a, a context in which you have one or more processes put in place to evaluate the harms uh, to people, uh, harms or injuries, and then compensation structures. Uh, community, uh, neighborhoods, restorative justice, uh, neighborhoods, uh, uh, the online processes now that are available in social media, uh, these fall under this uh, category as well. The more usual organizations in conflict would be in the commercial uh, context, vendors, suppliers, uh, regulators, consumers, uh, the whole commercial array, including of course, online uh, commerce as well. And then employment and ombuds that Lisa just touched on. Uh, in the labor uh, chapter. And then at the international level, uh, pushing the boundaries, uh, thinking about treaties. That is how I started my thinking about dispute system design was looking at the World Trade Organization and not just looking at the arbitral process that WTO has in place and is highly vaunted, um, but also the implementation processes and the treaty negotiation processes and what were the connections between those. Same issues in all contexts, same countries, but very different processes. So really looking at it as a, a, a system rather than just a process. Uh, Cross-boundary commerce, certainly eBay, PayPal, uh, Alibaba, there is a whole world full of commerce wherein there is not a geographical, physical option to solve problems in person. And, and so uh, the online processes have developed. Um, Scott is working in uh, this area in the whole cyber uh, space in terms of artificial intelligence. And when Lisa talked about who designs the system, uh, whether it's the first party, second party, third party, it could be the fourth party, what Ethan Cash has called uh, the technology serving as a party and a participant, and now is in the position of making decisions and sorting disputes in different contexts. Uh, and then transitional justice, uh, the focus on in a post-conflict society, what kind of processes are put in place and what are the goals? A really nice example of whether peace or justice or some combination are the important um, uh, focus. So thinking now that you have a, a bunch of contexts in your mind is to look at the framework. So I want to, to nod to uh, Stephanie Smith, our co-author uh, and her colleague uh, and ours, uh, Maude Previer, who started teaching class on conflict resolution system design back in the yesteryear, uh, the early 2000s. And uh, during that process, they came up with a number of diagnostic uh, elements. And so the six that we have decided to focus on in the book are goals, stakeholders, context and culture, processes and structure, uh, resources and then success and accountability. So it, uh, we tried to arrange them in some snappy acronym. We're not quite there yet. So you just have to remember six things. Uh, the goals is by far the most important, I think of the elements, because unless you know what you're trying to achieve, it's really hard to measure whether you did it well or not. So thinking about goals, what are the kinds of conflicts that the system is uh, oriented to address 
And what do you want to accomplish? Is it efficiency? Is it party experience? Is it voice? Is it uh, compliance with law? There are many tens of goals that might be optimal, but someone needs to determine what is the priority and how will those be measured and assessed. Uh, stakeholders. So often we talk about stakeholders participating along with actors in a given process or system. Uh, who are the stakeholders and uh, are they involved uh, or are they observing from a distance? Uh, in many, many cases, I read about we interviewed stakeholders. Well, did the stakeholders get to come to the table? Did they get to speak? Did they get to vote? Uh, and so I think there are different levels of determining which actors, who cares, who's affected by the system. Uh, and what is their relative power, their opportunity to speak and make decisions? And what are their interests and how are the interests represented within the system? So the stakeholder mapping and the interview process, conflict assessment that uh, involves interviewing and engaging stakeholders is a critical follow on to the goals. The context and culture uh, is really looking at what is the situation in which the system is functioning and um, being designed. And as Lisa mentioned, it's not only important to design a system, it, you're designing a process for designing the system as well. And the stakeholders play a role at both levels. Uh, does, how does the context affect viability and success? So is this an, uh, a situation of urgency? Like for example, 9-11 or Katrina or BP, those claims facilities, highly urgent and critical, so much harm and injury. Uh, and so what is the situation in which you're trying to come up with the system? Clearly it needs to be pretty quick, but if it's pretty quick, then it's not as engaging, not as much time to interview and, and have participation of the affected parties. What are the cultural aspects uh, of the organization uh, that are important to consider? I, um, I was doing some work in Ireland uh, some years ago, uh, and it had to do with a, a community and oil development. And there was a lot of tension in the community over the oil company coming in uh, to, to exploit the, the resource. And uh, I was interviewing a number of people in town, including a priest. And, and I said, tell me about conflict in Irish culture. How, how do people think about conflict? How do they resolve it or address it? And he thought for a minute and he said, they nurse it. And I thought, well, that's really important to understand that they process. Some societies uh, do not acknowledge the conflict. So really thinking about how does conflict uh, get addressed within a society? And what are the norms for communication in conflict management? Uh, processes and structure. Uh, the processes is kind of the heart of uh, dispute system design. What processes are used uh, for preventing, for managing over time, for resolving a given dispute? If there's more than one process, are they linked or integrated? Uh, what are the incentives and the disincentives for using the system? Uh, are people punished for using a process that's public and transparent? And so more hesitation to, uh, you may design a system that seems good, but it doesn't really fit the people, the culture, the context. And what is the system's interaction with the formal legal system? And how, uh, how do those connect? How are they sequenced? So thinking about um, the process options as Lisa touched on in the design uh, and control is also to think about, does the process involve the parties uh, having control over their own um, future? Uh, is, who has control of the process? who has control of the outcome. So negotiation at a very basic level, the parties retain uh, control over both the outcome and the process. 
uh, when we add a third party like a mediator, arbitrator, evaluator, that third party has a role. And now a lot of the power over outcome and process is shifting to the third party. Third party in arbitration and court, uh, third party has control over both outcome and process. Mediation, the parties retain control over the outcome, but the mediator manages the process. There are tens, I think we have 30 some processes in the book that we describe, um, but, it, uh, but there are a number, tens of processes. And now with the, uh, the advent of online processes, uh, both the Zoom as a mechanism and also uh, processes, use of artificial intelligence, agents and avatars. There's all kinds of fanciness coming up. Uh, these processes are different combinations in hybrid combinations uh, that we get to consider and, and, and adopt. Uh, resources is critical in that if you don't have the resources uh, to implement the pro uh, system that you designed, at least in your in your committee, uh, it will be a failure most likely, and you'll be worse off in many ways than if you had not even launched a system. So thinking about if you have a system that's got three process options and um, all kinds of opportunities for voice and participation, uh, but you have a bicycle budget or you're in a time of budget cutbacks like California has been, uh, then the resources for technical, for human resource and financial support for the system is going to compromise the whole undertaking. So really thinking carefully about aligning uh, the, the goals the processes uh, and whether the resources are adequate for the job. And then success and accountability, transparency about how the system works uh, and what the system's outcomes are and do they align with the goals that were established uh, upfront. So these are, these are the elements uh, of the framework that um, Maud Prevere and Stephanie developed and that Stephanie and I have continued to, uh, to teach from and have found that when our students write their research papers, they, they get it and uh, they are able to come up with really interesting examples and, and probe the application. So uh, it's heartening. I will say that teaching um, in this area really gives a constructive option to our students and to uh, the practitioners out in the world. So I wanted to just touch on I think I'm okay. Uh, touch on just two examples that link with uh, with your work in terms of natural resource management and in the whole uh, institutional analysis framework uh, that uh, Professor Ostrom developed. So thinking about that at a local level in California, we're one of the last states to adopt uh, groundwater management, but what with climate change and uh, the drought, uh, there was there's more focus, and so California now adopted legislation that said each basin in the state needs to come up with an agency, and they need to come up with a plan, and they have 20 years to demonstrate sustainable management of their groundwater. And if they don't do, if they don't achieve that goal, then the state will step in and the locals will, will lose their power and control and the state will do it for them. So that's a real incentive for, for the, uh, the basin to come up with something that's feasible and think about processes. And so Bill Blomquist and I are, are looking at the early stage development of dispute handling in dealing with different kinds of groundwater uh, situations and, and what kind of processes they choose and whether they automatically go to adjudication, which has the benefits of being transparent and uh, public and enforceable, um, or whether they will use more flexible processes like mediation, arbitration. So in looking at a number of basins uh, that have multi-entity uh, governance structures, uh, we, looked, we found that two thirds of them had dispute resolution processes in place and processes is uh, broadly writ. Uh, it ranges from 
the parties will use their best efforts to solve the problem. One sentence, that's it. Uh, others have two to three pages of many paragraphs and many processes. So we'll see over time what the parties actually use and whether they're suited to the needs of, of groundwater ownership and property rights and going forward. Uh, on the global uh, front, I'm looking uh, at, with the Center for Ocean Solutions at Stanford. Uh, we're looking at illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, IUU fishing. Uh, and so one, uh, one narrow uh, piece of this is looking at what the, um, what the supply chain looks like. And is there a way to develop a data gathering? So this would be at the preventing level of the managing as well as resolving and enforcing level on, on fishing and, uh, and forced labor that is often associated with the IUU fishing. Uh, so looking at uh, online processes, uh, digital contracts, um, coming up with an easy assessment tool that says whether a supply chain uh, member is red, green, or yellow uh, in terms of the risk and uh, uh, illegal fishing. So I think that the the opportunity for looking at system design uh, in all the elements that we've outlined uh, is really before us and the commons, whether it's in the ocean or local water supplies uh, or other natural resources, I think will be an opportunity for, for design uh, experience and research. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, that was absolutely fantastic. And I should have mentioned up front, but just for the record, Janet is also the director of Stanford's Gould Negotiation and Mediation Program and director of their ADR research initiative. I'm wondering before we turn things over to our discussion, whether um, Stephanie as well, I'm not sure Stephanie, if you wanted to say um, say a word up front. Um, and of course, to properly introduce you as well, lecturer in law, as we said at Stanford Law, as well as in resident scholar at the Gould uh, ADR um, uh, research initiative. So. Uh, did you want to say a word, Stephanie, up front, or just kind of hold back and just chime in during Q and A as you prefer? Yeah, I think I think mostly I'll be uh, hanging back, but but uh, thank you all for this wonderful opportunity and uh, for Jan and Lisa for preparing the presentations, um, mm -hmm. and also again we were so appreciative of the workshop's wonderful feedback in 2014, which was enormously helpful. So. Thank you all. And at this point, I'll disappear again. Thanks. <laughs> no, that's no problem. I just want to make sure you at least have the opportunity. Um, well, first off, a virtual round of applause, because that was just fantastic. Talk about a tour, a tour de force. I think you managed a workshop hat trick. I was keeping track, and I think you were able to touch on every single major research program and working group <laughs> that we have. <laughs> so talk about it, just a fantastic way to really kick off um, the Ocean Book Club. So thank you so much for that. I have, I have several questions and reflections myself. But I want to make sure that we have time to get to as many as possible. And I see that you know hands are already going up. So we're going to turn um, to those folks first. And I promise to circle back. Um, so uh, without further ado, it looks like Mike, you are you were first to jump the gun. So well done. Um, so would you like to get us started? Uh, thanks, Scott. Yes. Um, and let me say, as the person who was organizing that uh, con that book party a few years ago, what is it? Five years ago now. Uh, six years ago, uh, things have really come along very well, and I, I look forward to seeing the final the final product. Um, fascinating presentation. Uh, one of the issues that I'm having a little trouble of understanding is how the concept of forum shopping, forum shopping is handled within this sort of system, because it sounds like any process you set up or, or help a community set up has multiple options and different processes that could be selected for the resolution of certain disputes, particular of a particular dispute. And to the extent that the parties understand what's likely to happen in those processes, which if they were designed and they were they were involved in designing the process, they should have some understanding of what are going to be the different sort of approaches. How do you avoid having situations where different parties within the community are trying to manipulate the situation to go into this process that's going to be more likely to serve their interest and another group going into another party, another process that'll go other sort of interest. So there's like a, a, a higher level resolution problem of which process are you going to use before you even go into the process. So 
so how does the the your your concept of dispute just system design handle that kind of competitive manipulation of the option Dan? yeah um so i i have a couple an, a couple answers uh, or comments put it uh that way um in one case i can think uh where there are an array of process options and the party can choose. Uh, I like, you know, door A, door B or door C. So for an example, um, with uh, claims facilities, it could be in the case of BP that uh, some people need money now and they don't care so much about a long process and an opportunity to be heard. Um, they just need uh, money right now so they can feed their family. Uh, number two, maybe they're willing to gather some records uh, that weren't taken away in the flood. And so they can demonstrate a certain loss and then they will get a, uh, a more tailored uh, result, yeah, process and result. Third, they maybe want to appear uh, and they want to have the full shebang. They want to be heard, they want to be mediated, and they want an opportunity to present evidence. So I think um, that would be a, a system that is set up that the users want to have a choice and they're not all the same. Uh, so they're not mandated. Other cases, it may well be like going to court. Uh, a court may say, uh, yes, we'll give you a court date out three years, but we suggest that you uh, try mediation first. And so, and, and that be kind of a stepped process or a tiered process. So, and I think um, there's a new, I don't know the term for it, um, but there's something now where people can allocate and say, we will litigate these uh, subset of issues and we will go through a more consensual process uh, as well. So they're uh, ex ante deciding up front. Uh, these kinds of issues will be litigated. These will be, uh, will at least try some consultative process. And then a lot has to do with uh, who can afford it. So if you like mediation or you like arbitration, do you get a panel of three arbitrators and who pays for it? So then it becomes a really an access to justice question. And with online processes, I can imagine that some people, you will get your divorce online, for an example. That's a very useful process. Uh, a number of people really prefer doing the parental plan and divorce process online. They don't have to go to court, don't have to see the other person. But I wonder at some point whether this is going to mean that people get different quality of experience based on their resources. So I think it raises an access to justice question. So this is that is as much to say is you're raising an important question. Different systems are going to handle it in different ways, uh, but it's definitely a diagnostic question that you would want to ask. And if, if I could just, thank you, Jan. Um, mm -hmm. I wish I could take your classes. I'm going to retire and go take Jan's classes. Um, <laughs> There's an assumption built into your question, Mike, and the assumption is that you can forum shop. And with adhesive arbitration, it's not foreign shopping, forum shopping, it's claim suppression. That's really the objective of the system and it's working. Thanks a lot. Are you satisfied for now, Mike, or would you, did no, you have to follow up? Yeah, yeah. Explain what you mean by, by claim suppression. Well, for example, um, because arbitration clauses are so broadly construed by the Supreme Court and widely enforced, mm -hmm. you can suppress class actions. You mm -hmm. can even refuse to have collective arbitration. So you can't have class arbitration. Those can be suppressed. And then you can also shift transaction costs so that the loser pays the arbitrator. Lawyers who can't recover damages in a court with a jury, the, the, the burden of proof is different. So for example, in arbitration, the employee may actually raise an EEO case and establish a prima facie case, but the arbitrator may not apply burden shifting that the Supreme Court calls for under Title VII and instead may put may apply an at-will employment 
standard of proof with the burden on the employee. So the lawyer's not going to take that case. The employee is likely to lose, and then they'll have to pay the attorney's fees for the company, which can be exorbitant in, in one class arbitration uh, involving consumer protection and a for-profit uh, university, the damages, the, the school, the university hired two different law firms and the arbitrator awarded them over $600,000 in attorney's fees to this small class. So it suppresses, people aren't gonna take the risk and that's how it suppresses claims. Okay, thanks, that helped. Thank you. And uh, Bill, I think Bill's up next. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, congratulations on the book. Great to see uh, you and um, great to see a, a subject like this get front and center attention uh, when sometimes how we're gonna deal with resolution with the resolution of conflicts can be, um, I don't know, push to the back burner, you know, well, we'll deal with that when we get there, that kind of thing. The, the question I have is about context. And I noticed uh, in, 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 as you were going through the presentation about the book that you've got a chapter about collaborative governance. So uh, if I should just wait and read that, you can say, just <laughs> wait and read that. But I have this question about context. I, you can think about, I can think about a dispute system that is designed to operate when the users of it are all in an organization. Mm -hmm. So like your sort of classic HR kind of, of situation where everybody's under an organized authority structure of some kind. I can think about dispute system design in the context of a contractual relationship where everybody's not under the same organizational structure, we're different parties, but um, we've got some kind of documented and presumably enforceable commitment. And then I can think about a collaborative governance structure where there may be no contract and there's no organized authority structure over the whole thing. And I just wanted to get you to, to uh, talk a bit uh, or think out loud with this, uh, however you want to approach it, of how those different contexts matter. To something like dispute system design. Thanks. If, if I could uh, jump in on this one for a minute first. Uh, the way that we define collaborative governance um, involves looking at the policy continuum, uh, although we know it's a spiral, but, but reducing it to a line, right? Upstream in the legislative and quasi-legislative arena, midstream in the executive implementation area of governance and then downstream in the quasi-judicial and judicial arena. And so when you frame it that way, and we're talking about governance, meaning the in involvement, if, if it were in the public sector, the involvement of the public, then upstream would include public engagement uh, and deliberative democracy as a way of helping frame a process that might progress over time and through different stages. So it's uh, unfortunately the way that happens most of the time in the United States in connection with government is by bringing in consultants. We don't yet have good infrastructure in government for convening collaborative governance processes. But collaborative governance under that umbrella definition, and we do talk about this in chapter three, would, in, would uh, include dialogue, deliberation, deliberative democracy, upstream, midstream, it would also add in collaborative public management and, and dispute resolution because you've got, for example, the United States Institute for Environmental Conflict Resolution and it has framed some of its work as collaborative governance. And it, it does projects including water disputes, cross-border water disputes in uh, the Southwest and, and Mexico. Um, and then downstream, uh, the dispute resolution stuff, 
of course, we're all more familiar with. And I think that's probably what you're more thinking about when you think about the book. But, but we do try to encompass in a few chapters, this broader framing in the environmental chapter and, and the collaborative governance chapter. Now, one difference between the book and the collaborative governance literature and public administration is that we also include collaborative governance as something possible for private corporations. So you think about corporate social responsibility. I mean, that involves public engagement. It, it should involve sort of stakeholder collaboration. Um, it's related to sustainability action plans that companies adopt. Uh, and it, there is a, an upstream policy making, uh, you know, companies make policies um, midstream implementing them. And then policies have the enforcement piece uh, in, in terms of dispute resolution programs. I'm not sure if that's responsive enough, Bill. It makes sense to me, Lisa, I really appreciate it. Um, these, I'm, I'm just, above all, I'm glad that, that your book um, you know, takes these different contextual um, settings into account. So appreciate it, thanks. Well, thanks a lot, Bill. Um, and then next in the queue, we have uh, Jamie Carini. And if you'd like to um, introduce yourself briefly as well, for the folks who don't know, including our distinguished guests, uh, feel free to, Jamie. Oh, okay, great. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Carini, and I'm an Ostrom Fellow this year, and I'm housed at the Jacobs School of Music. So it's great to be part of the Ostrom Workshop, though. Uh, the, I, I think this is my uh, my best year in my doctoral program. I'm just having so much fun. <laughs> so thanks, guys. <laughs> um, but uh, so part of, obviously, you know, so I, I am I'm, I'm interested in questions of political economy all the time. I attended a a graduate colloquium about a year ago where we talked about special economic zones and how these sort of protected economic zones create interesting challenges to justice. And what made me think about this was the, the reference to the fact that in some circumstances, justice is really challenging because the ge geographical boundary, there just really aren't geographical boundaries. And we're so used to thinking of justice in terms of like a a geographical border like if you live in this district you go to this court or if you're a company with you know offices in multiple states then you have more options to go to different courts to you know to try and seek justice and so one of the questions that came up as talking about special economic zones i was introduced to a, comp a country that a, a country kind of a quasi country that existed in europe for about 100 years and i forget what it's called i'm sorry i can find out and tell you but they had the option, but they were sort of protected by this treaty. It was this area of, of land. Maybe it wasn't a country, but it was this area of land protected by a treaty because they didn't really have their own judicial system. They could go over into like, I forget, Austria or Belgium or Germany if they, so they had like multiple options for judicial, for types of justice systems they want if they had a dispute come up amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. So unlike people living just across the border, um, they had, they had options. Do you think that's, possible today? Well, I think there's a version of that happening with cross-border commerce. And, and I think uh, China, I visited China's um, first online court a couple years ago. And basically uh, they are trying to, uh, trying to develop in China a private version of dispute resolution that is running in parallel with the courts. So it's just like you're describing is that you could choose the Alibaba mega dispute resolution process uh, for dealing. And I think that's what they're aspiring to. And they're working with the International Standards Organization to come up with some standards for that pro process system so that you could choose. So. I think there's a version of it evolving before our eyes. Uh, yes. Quite organically. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, I have just a quick question as well to throw out. I, I really enjoyed so much of this and frankly look forward to reading, re reading the rest. But one of the chapters that really caught my attention was chapter 16. No surprise. In which yes. you're discussing international <laughs> you know, dispute resolution. 
Um, and I thought the bilateral investment treaty, you know, discussion actually was was quite helpful. But I, I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit on why you chose those, you know, particular examples. So the Court of Arbitration for Sport, FIT, <laughs> World Trade Organization, UN. I really liked your fishing example right at the end there, um, yeah. Janet. So I'm wondering maybe that's follow up, you know, work, which is absolutely, yeah. you know, perfect. But I just thought you could maybe mention how you landed on these and how, why you thought they were illustrative. Uh, as a scholarly question, you're really good, Scott. Uh, I picked them because I knew something about them and I thought they were interesting. And I, that's pretty much the way I approached the chapters that I worked on. Uh, I knew something, it wasn't um, an empirically structured uh, question. You know, where does the hypothesis, uh, you know, play out most effectively? To, to, as, as uh, Ostrom would say, how do I graduate from a framework to a theory? Um, uh, so I think uh, that's why I, I picked them because they were different, but I knew something about it. Or I had a student that knew a lot, like the Court of Arbitration for Sport. I had a student who had been an arbitrator for them for a number of years and wrote an article. And so I thought this is interesting and it has a different structure and a different set of goals. So I was mostly looking for some contrast um, in that. So no, that, that's, that's, that's my answer. <laughs> so. Perfectly legitimate. I've, I've done the same thing. <laughs> so that's, that's yeah. no problem at all. Thank you. I just want um, to add on the Court of Arbitration for Sport. I was an Olympic sports arbitrator in 1992 before the Court of Arbitration for Sport had its current design. Mm -hmm. And I, I walked into a room in Indianapolis with two lawyers. And the lawyer for the United States Olympic Committee said to me, Madam Arbitrator, there's just something you need to understand about the case. You, we will comply with your award, whatever it is. It was a drug testing case for a track and field athlete, an elite track and field athlete. And he proceeded to say, we will comply. We have to under su the Supreme Court's decisions. However, the uh, International Olympic Committee is not bound by your award. And there's something called the contamination rule, which means if they disagree with your award after we have uh, put that athlete on the field, they can disqualify the entire 1992 su uh, Summer Olympics track and field team from the United States. Just thought you should know. Anyway, <laughs> moving right along. That's a clear dispute system design problem. No finality. That, yeah. That's an amazing anecdote. Lisa, have I had that? I think I would lead on that with my bio, but that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I wrote for the athlete and he got a silver medal. It was oh, <laughs> even better. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Um, and I know we don't have a lot of time left, but Gustavo um, is up next and then we do have Brian. So Gustavo, would you like to go ahead? Good, thanks. Um, uh I have a question that uh, maybe because uh, I don't know much about this this literature, so it's um, I was thinking it's um, what are the, the key determinants of um, essentially uh, what's the, the the balance between using the standard courts versus arbitration? So essentially, uh, my question is: Should we essentially ban some things for going? in one direction or the other is like, well, these things cannot go uh, on arbitration, even if the parties involved won't, okay? Or the other way around, it's like, uh, let's say that two parties wants to go to the courts, is there any good reason to send them to arbitration? So I, I was trying to kind of develop a basic framework to think about uh, what is the balance or what force is pushing one direction or the other. And I was thinking more about, I don't know, for example, two states discussing about borders. Should we allow them to go arbitration? Two political parties discussing about election rules. Should we allow them to go arbitration or they should be forced to go to the courts? So those type of things, or maybe, I don't know, other or, or their direction, two um, uh, parties that they want to use arbitration and we are forcing them to go to the courts or that way around. Uh, but I'm not clear, I don't know, it doesn't come to my mind what could be the reasons to go in one direction or, or the other. And again, I'm completely ignorant of this literature, so maybe it's a very naive or silly question already solved in the literature. 
For sure. And it's a good question about maybe even reform efforts, if you want to take it in that direction as well, you know, Jan or Lisa or Stephanie. <laughs> um, Lisa, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, because, I mean, there's arbitration at different levels, whether it's commercial, consumer, international. We, so, Gustavo, we have to go back to rules on paper and rules on use, ultimately, because jurisdiction is defined by these rules within a given nation. So if we're just talking about conflict between New York and New Jersey um, over the Hudson River, the Supreme Court basically has original jurisdiction <laughs> even at the trial level for that kind of a dispute. Um, the, uh, the legal framework for arbitration in the Federal Arbitration Act in the United States, which is not true in other countries. We're the only ones who have this insane interpretation of this statute. Um, it's, it's actually forced arbitration is banned in the EU. Um, but the Supreme Court's interpreted it to empower corporations to adopt the clauses and keep people from going to court. So if you're gonna change it and Congress has voted on multiple occasions, or at least the House of Representatives has, to adopt amendments to the Federal Arbitration Act to ban this. But they don't make it up to the president for signature. And Obama, who should have, did not make it a priority. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a legal reform issue. Now, globally, the, the, um, the problem that is also a legal reform issue are these bilateral investment treaties because they empower an arbitrator, a private unelected human to make a decision that binds two countries. And uh, that decision can order one of the countries not to enforce its national environmental law. So one student uh, who Scott may have been aware of um, did her, uh, her master's thesis at the, uh, the School of Global and International Affairs on the bilateral investment treaty governing um, Mongolia and the Netherlands that Canada used to win an award of $55 million against the country of Mongolia. That's the entire public school budget for the country, which has 3 million people. So we've got massive problems. And because people are not paying attention to dispute system design, they don't understand the rules on paper and rules in use that are shaping what's happening to them in the action arena. And thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah, and great question, Gustavo. And then we're pretty much out of time. Um, so I hate to cut this so short, Brian, but would you like to maybe just pose kind of a quick one and we can circle? Or Okay. Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, well, in that case, without further ado, any, any final reflections um, or, or uh, next steps for, for, you, for your team? Is there another publication plan or how can you rest on your laurels for a while now that this thing is finally out? <laughs> I think uh, I've, I've decided not to write another book, um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but articles may be forthcoming. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for the warm welcome and interest. Oh, absolutely. No, no. Thank you. Thank you all again. We look forward to reading those. I'm glad you can drop the mic and walk away. <laughs> At this, point, this, this is quite the accomplishment. I would say that if you check out the flyer, um, I, I'd hardly recommend this book. It, there is a discount code. <laughs> That's yes. 20. Sure. So, you know, be sure to use that. Of course, I've, I haven't actually checked. It might be available even an IU cat. Um, as an ebook um, for free as well. So be, be sure to check that out. And I would say lastly, it has five stars. So there you go um, oh, on okay. Amazon. So <laughs> talk about a different different dispute resolution system there. Um, so one more round of applause to, uh, to Janet and Lisa and Stephanie. Thank you all so much so for joining us and for launching the Ostrom okay. Book Club. Okay, thank, thank you. All. Thank Bye, you. Scott. Bye, thank all. You so much. And just as a quick reminder, guys, if you know of other books to feature in this series, please do let us know. We're excited to continue this on. And lastly, some late breaking news. We just got word yesterday um, that Lynn's statue is gonna be unveiled on November 12th um, outside of Woodford. Uh -oh. 
We oh, don't have thanks. details yet about the timing or the agenda. The workshop is going to be kind of co-sponsoring a follow-up virtual event as well. Um, so you might just kind of mentally mark your calendars for the time being since we're still working out the details, but it'll be on November 12th. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. So we're excited Thank about that. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Okay. Take bye care. Bye. <laughs>